Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course, uh, this is Newton, Sir Isaac Newton with me, who's now uh, 14 months old, and uh, his uh, dad and mom were between 40 and 50 pounds, and he's, I think he's about 65 now, so not sure what happened. Some people tell me that um, the genetics uh, for weight with some dogs can skip a, a generation. So I guess his grandparents were huge. I'm going to talk about the um, Sargasso Sea or Sargassum, the um, pelagic, meaning on the surface, algae that forms in these huge masses. And uh, there's a lot of it right now in the, uh, you know, extending all the way in these bands from Africa all the way to the Caribbean. Um, there's some concern in Florida, for example, that it will run ashore. You know, Florida is experiencing red tides right now. So I'm going to talk about both those things. The, the um, seaweed mass that is being tracked from space and also the, um, the, the red tides that we're, that we're seeing. Newton, do you want to say hello? Do you want to say hi? I think he just wants to get down. He's uh, pretty heavy. On my, maybe he'll stay here while I'm filming this. I'm not sure. I might have to get up and and lift him. You know, he might want his freedom out of it. Yeah, he does. Hang on a second. You want to go out, don't you? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, good boy. Okay. So this is an uh, article from just a few days ago. Um, University of, uh, University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, uh, U University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, researchers are tracking the seaweed mass that's visible from space. And you can see this brownish, reddish mat. These are sargassum masses. You know, they can easily, um, just come ashore and trap boats, etc. So this is in the uh, Cayman Islands, huge masses. And of course, they do have a big effect on the coastline because they block out all the sunlight. So if they're over coral reefs, the reefs can die. It depends on how long um, the stuff is there. You know, when it starts to decompose, it can produce uh, hydrogen sulfide, which is very, you know, bad gas. It's the reason why so-called natural gas has that smell, you know, it's 90 plus percent methane, but they put in some, you know, some uh, various uh, things. Actually, it's not hydrogen sulfide. They put in some chemicals, sulfur chemicals, to uh, make it smell bad so that if there's a leak, it warns you. Um, we should change that name, natural gas. It's a misnomer. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's very harmful for the environment. Of course, the greenhouse warming potential is very large for methane. Okay, so there's this, um, so for the last seven years, there's um, researchers at the, the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. They have a special oceanography institute to track um, an ever-growing accumulation of what most people refer to as seaweed. So... Um, many publications call it a blob. They call the floating sargassum bloom a blob, but it's really a belt. Um, it stretches now from the coast of Africa to the Caribbean, but it's not continuous. So the mass is about 5,000 miles long, which is twice the length of the U.S. It's visible from space. Um, what began as an anomaly in 2011 is now breaking size records. So they really un want to understand, you know, what's what's going on with this. Um, you know, what are the causes? What are the consequences? I mean, they this guy um, called it um, a new normal. I don't really don't like the new normal. I mean, we're undergoing abrupt system change, going from one state to another. Um, there is no new normal. The new normal. If you if if you thought there was a new normal, basically it's just massive change all the time. So, you know, the states are changing, depends on, on and, and where you live, the effects that you're seeing depend on latitude, depends on your, you know, your the geography of the region that you're in. Um, 
So before 2011, there was almost no seaweed in the tropical Atlantic or the Caribbean Sea. Okay, so this is a um, satellite-based map from March 7th to 13th of this month showing the expansive bloom uh, here and it's it's heading this way towards Florida. So you can see, you know, the red bands are really high um, amounts of sargassum and uh, you can see the extent of, of the whole thing. Um, yeah, there's massive amounts of it. So the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is actually the world's largest brown algae bloom. The mass drifts between the coast of Africa and the Gulf of Mexico, providing a rich marine habitat while absorbing CO2. So it does, is a plant, right? It does absorb vast amounts of CO2. Um, you know, there's some idea that, you know, if we could somehow sink this stuff to the bottom, we could sequester that carbon. And then, you know, maybe we want a lot of it to grow and we sink it to the bottom, sequester carbon. But, you know, how would you go about doing that? You know, once the seaweed reaches the shore, it kind of gets stuck in place. It degrades the water quality, can emit, emit a no, noxious odor with the hyd because there's hydrogen sulfide in it. It attracts insects and bacteria and repels tourists, and, which affect, impacts local economies. Governments must pay huge amounts of money, millions of dollars, to clean up tons of the rotting mess. They should turn it into fertilizer or something, or they should sell it to um, drug companies to, because uh, you know the chemicals in it um, are, have a lot of different health benefits. So you know the the um, the the that industry uh, could use it anyway. They they should if they if they do capture it, they should use it rather than just let it rot to nothing. Okay, so the U USF. University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, they have something called the Optical Oceanography Laboratory. So they track and study these blooms using satellites and field work. And they're funded by NOAA. The mass could affect shipping routes and trap smaller boats by tangling around propellers and clogging intake valves. Um, once you're in the mass, it's really hard to get out. Um, a continuous single mat could be several miles long and 100 meters wide. Um, and um, yeah, so there's many reports that have been out in the news recently. Um, it's still uh, an open question as to whether this mass will significantly affect the, the, the uh, Tampa Bay area of Florida or most of Florida for that matter. Um, Beaches in the Panhandle and south of Naples could experience some impacts with more along the Florida Keys. I wonder, I hope a mass doesn't go, you know that guy who's uh, underneath the water in the, in the Jules, uh, the Jules uh, Lodge? Um, he's, he went under the water. He's, he's aiming for 100 days, about 30 feet down, 20 to 30 feet down. Um, and you can follow him on Twitter. He's still there. He went down March 1st. So, uh, you know, he's been down three weeks, 22 days. So he's a fifth of his way of his way through the thing. So if this went above him, it would completely, you know, it'd be completely dark down there 24 seven. Anyway, uh, local managers along the beaches, they're prepared to remove the seaweed in time every day before it decomposes. But, uh, you know, it's nothing like major hurricanes or red tides. They, they're experiencing red tides in quite a bit of the um, coastlines of Florida now. So sargassum inundation in Florida, it costs many millions of dollars per year to clean the beaches. Um, so here is a beach, uh, Key, Key West, Smathers Beach, Key West. Um, um, March 5th, 2023, you can see it all along the shoreline here. This is sargassum aerial density. Um, okay, the density of it, so higher density, high, more amounts of, of the sargassum unless this is February of 2023. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, the, the uh, extent of the, of the uh, sargassum this year. Um, hydrogen sulfide release from rotting sargassum. It could cause respiratory problems for anybody nearby. 
Officials in Mexico warned of seaweed accumulations reaching three feet deep in some areas along beaches in Mexico. Um, and uh, there were only a few relatively small intermittent clumps of sargassum in the Atlantic until 2011, and then it really started taking off. When the belt began forming 12 years ago, its size didn't raise many eyebrows. Everything changed about five years ago. The mass began growing exponentially, and we know how quickly exponential growth can be, setting records in 2018 and 2022. This year's bloom is the largest in history for March. And I'll show you some images through the years. Um, the mass, typically the seaweed reaches a maximum area in June or July, right? The water temperature warms up. There's lots of nutrients. Um, the mass increases annually on average. Um, basically, you know, climate change is a big impact because it's warming the water. It's, it's um, human influence, um, you know, not just by, by climate change, but also the nutrients that go into the water, uh, phosphorus and nitrates and potassium. Um, it's a complex issue with many factors like the harmful algal blooms that cause red tide. So that's a different um, source. Um, typically though, sargassum is non-toxic, but of course too much of a good thing becomes bad. You know, the biggest thing is when a seaweed blanket forms, it keeps light from penetrating through the water surface. Marine life depends on light. So dead plants and animals absorb critical oxygen as they rot. So this is a problem from all angles, um, right? If it sticks around on the shoreline, it can block all the light and cause tremendous uh, damage to uh, the life on the, on the underneath it. Okay, so it's a, a very double-edged Sword. So let's have a look at some of the, the data. I mean, this picture is pretty incredible. Okay, so this is the University of South Florida, the Optical Oceanography Laboratory. So there's some interesting stuff. You can just play around here and look at some interesting stuff. So this is the, um, basically, you know, what is, satel so satellite-based sargassum watch system. There's two main types here. Sargassum natans is this form here, you know, the spindly sort of stuff. And then sargassum fluitans with the larger um, uh, little uh, buoyant pockets that are sitting on it. So, um, okay, so there's the two main types. Uh, this is a beaching event on the east coast of Barbados. Stuff can be super thick, can cost tremendous amounts of money to take, take away. So the Sargassum Watch system, SAWS, uses satellite data and numerical models to detect and track pelagic, that's the surface sargassum in near real time. Um, so pelagic sargassum seaweed, it's a brown macro algae um, floating on the ocean surface. There's primarily two species, S. nadens and S. Um, S. nadens and, and F. S. Uh, fluitans. Um, it's abundant in the intra america Sea, the Atlantic, along the coast of the British Isles and mainland Europe. Um, okay. Uh, in the ocean, it serves as an important habitat. It's a floating habitat, so there's loads of marine animals that use it for f find food in it. They use it for shade. They shelter from predators. Uh, fish, uh, shrimp, crabs, and turtles are all within it. Sargassum may serve as fertilizer for sand dunes and thus protect shoreline stability. It's a marine resource for other uses such as biomass for food, fuel, and as a possible source of pharmaceutical materials. There's lots of iodine in these sort of things and iodine can be very helpful for, for the human body, for example, for uh, cleaning out the pipes in, in males uh, who have prostate cyst problems. Um, you know, of course, there's, you know, when it decomposes, um, it smells bad, attracts insects, causes many environmental problems, can smother turtle nesting sites, cause sea turtle mortality, fish kills, economic problems, of course, diminish tourism, um, and so on. So, so this is being tracked by this laboratory, um, how it's monitored, um, you know, modus terra, modus aqua, 
uh, Landsat, some other sensors are looking at it, you know, dear, on a near daily basis at various spectral bands. And you can see uh, some of it here. Uh, floating algae index left reveals algae and color index shows the circulation patterns. Um, okay, uh, the, where the images are found, um, there's a clickable map where you can set the start date and end date and play movies and you can see how this stuff moves over time. Um, and uh, you can see, uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, ocean currents are also being monitored because surface currents are, are what are transporting and pulling the stuff along. You know, and once it's pulled along one way, the re a lot of it follows and thus it's, the whole thing's ripped apart. Here's some photos of how sargassum is impacting the, impacted the Caribbean. So some photos. So this is an airborne survey in 2015, spring and summer, Martinique, uh, sorry, uh, Cape Gua Guadeloupe. Right, you can see the uh, sargassum here. This is um, uh, another image here. You know, you can see how it's much more thicker there. And any of the reef or, or life underneath is severely affected. This is a beaching event um, here and here and also here. I mean, this is, you know, stranded boat um, is, uh, you know, the, the, where the picture is taken from, I guess. Okay, and there's lots of reference to peer-reviewed scientific papers that mo describe the work that is being done on how it's being monitored. Okay, there's also uh, bulletins, up-to-date bulletins. So let's have a look at some of the bulletins. Um, so this is um, the bulletins uh, link, and it shows you, uh, so it shows how uh, these, how much sargassum seaweed there is in the Caribbean Sea every summer. Um, it, it, well, it, you can go through each month and see how it is. So these maps here show February for the last number of years. So not much, 2015 a bit, 2018, a huge amount. That's the record amount for February. And then um, there's been a little bit each year since then. Uh, here we are in 2023, you know, 2021 was a pretty big year and 2023 also, you know, this year. So there's a lot, but there's not as much as there was in, in 2018. Um, you can click on some of these outlooks. So I'm, I'm, I basically did that for February 2023. You know, the two most interesting ones here are this one here and this one here. Um, so I looked at those and... Um, so this is uh, the outlook for this year. This is March 1st. So basically what we see here is, you can see the progression. So this was it in, this was February, March, April, May in the given year. So 2018, it got more intense and concentrated, kind of spread out a bit and it continued on through March, February, March, April, May. So you can see what we can expect maybe this year. This year is not a record year, but it does beat 2021. And you can see how intense it got in 2021, also in 2022. So by, you know, by May, it's pretty intense um, for, for, say, the last five years. You know, highest in 2018, next in 2022. You know, we're starting uh, at the second highest level in February. So it could get, it could get pretty intense. Um, large quantities um, are already in the Caribbean. Um, they'll continue to accumulate and migrate westward with the trade winds pushing them, creating beaching hazards. The Florida Keys uh, may start to see small amounts in March, so they're they're monitoring it. They'll monitor it very closely. This is the place to go if you have any questions. Uh, these are the people that are the experts. Um, I also looked at the outlook in 2018 to see what it said. Uh, and uh, here we were here and, and, you know, they didn't know of course what was going on, but it got more intense and more intense and more intense as I showed you uh, in the previous image. Um, and there's lots of refereed peer reviewed papers on this. So even this year, you know, coastal phytoplankton blooms expand and intensify in the 21st century. 
you know, it's probably talking about the climate change impacts on it. Um, spectral analysis, what, um, what frequencies do you look from the satellite? You can tune the spectrometers to look at different frequencies, which frequencies are best for identifying the different algae blooms. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the estuaries are warming faster than the global ocean. So there's lots of, um, there's, there's lots of stuff, you know, stuff on the loop current. And these are all in 2023. So lots of stuff is coming out. Um, they're, they're, they do publish, uh, this group, uh, this college does publish an awful lot on the ocean. Okay, so a little bit about the Sargasso Sea. So this is, you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard that term. It's in a lot of the literature as well. You know, it's in songs, it's in music. Anyway, this is the Sargasso Sea. You know, it's not, it's not an, an enclosed sea. Is bounded by four currents that form an ocean gyre. It's one of the ocean gyres. It's the North Atlantic Ocean Gyre. Um, and you know the Gulf Stream moves up this way. Things deflect to the right in the Northern Hemisphere because of the Coriolis force. So that's why it loops back this way. Um, and um, so we've got the Gulf Stream here, the North Atlantic Current. Then there's the Canary Current because of the Canary Islands and the North Atlantic Equatorial Current, the trade winds. So those four current systems cause, create the gyre. Um, it's about um, 1,100 kilometers or 680 miles um, wide. And it's about 3,200 kilometers or 2,000 miles long. And Bermuda's up here in the Western fringes. These, all of these above currents deposit marine plants and refuse um, into the sea. Ocean water in the Sargasso Sea is distinctive because it's deep blue. It's an exception. It's got exceptional clarity in general. Underwater visibility up to 61 meters or 200 feet. That's huge. Uh, that's very, very clear water. Um, it's also captured the public imagination, this body of water, the Sargasso Sea. So the first written account of it um, dates back to Christopher Columbus, 1492. He wrote this about seaweed that he feared, feared would trap his ship and potentially hide shallow waters underneath that they would could run aground on, as well as the lack of wind that he feared would trap them. So he, you know, had nightmares of being stuck inside the Sargasso Sea and never getting out. Um, but, it, you know, the sea has been known earlier to even early mariners, late 4th fourth, fourth century um, author, Avianius describes a portion of the Atlantic as being covered with seaweed and windless, um, and uh, so on. You can look more, there's, lo there's lots of history. This is an interesting anecdote. In July 1969, this British uh, businessman and amateur sailor, Donald Crowhurst, disappeared after his yacht became mired in the Sargasso Sea. He was competing in a race single-handed around the world yacht race. His boat uh, began to take on water. He abandoned his circumnavigation attempt, but reported false positions by radio to give the impression he was still participating. Eventually he wound up drifting in the Sargasso Sea. He deteriorated psychologically, filling his logbooks with metaphysical speculation and delusional comment. And his last entry was July 1st in 1969. His yacht was found unoccupied and drifting on July 10th. So he missed, uh, Basically, he missed being saved, survival by, you know, just oh, by nine days. It's unclear whether he died as a result of suicide or misadventure, just fell off his boat or whatever, but he, he wasn't found. The boat was found. Um, and the ecology, you know, the sea, there's the seaweed. Um, it's a, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is the largest sitch mass in the world. Uh, generally, the ships avoid them, so they're not a threat to shipping. But there's been his historic incidents of ships being trapped there. I mentioned the, the, the yacht guy. Um, eels, uh, the migration of eels makes use of the sargassum. Um, you know, there is, uh, there is a high concentration of plastics, of course, in the gyre, like all the other gyres. Um, this, you know, in the Sargassum Sea, it's a North Atlantic garbage patch, if you like. Um, and some people are looking to try to remove the, um, 
remove the garbage. I guess they'd have to remove the, the, the um, algae as well. Um, in popular culture, in literature and media, it's an area of mystery. It's often depicted in fiction as a dangerous area where ships are mired in weed for centuries, unable to escape. So it's in, um, you know, old uh, stories. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He describes the Sargasso Sea and gives an account of its formation. Um, it's in novels, it's in television, it's in music. Here we go. Uh, the eighth track of the 2023 album Time's Arrow by Lady Tron is called Sargasso Sea. Uh, you know, the Super Sargasso Sea, the Wide Sargasso Sea, Escaping Sargasso Sea. So it's in, it's, it's very much in, in popular culture. Okay, so these are the, uh, th this is just the ocean gyres. So, you know, there's, uh, this is the gyre the North Pacific Ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean. This is a gyre where the Sargassa, Sargasso Sea is, as I showed you. Uh, the red is warm currents. Notice if the currents originate near the equator, they're warm. As they move up north, they get colder. And then as they descend back down, they're actually colder currents, you know, completing the gyre here. You know the Gulf Stream moves north off the coast of North America. And you know, things deflect to the right in the southern hemisphere. So you can extend the arrows. And, uh, in, you know, same thing here. You know, the Kuroshi, Kuroshio current runs northeast um, off Japan. And then it, so you get it loops around here, the Alaska current. And then this loop here, these are the equatorial currents here, the equatorial, uh, north equatorial, South Equatorial, and there's a countercurrent here in the middle. And of course, these are very important for the ENSO, uh, whether the water is pushed over to South America or whether it stays over and gets really warm off, you know, in this part of the ocean. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, things are, re are reversed, things deflect to the left. So you'll notice the, um, the motion of these currents here, and you've got the, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which goes completely around the surface. Uh, because there's no land masses in the way. So if I gave you this map without the current, you should be able to quickly sketch and come up with something close to where, where these arrows were. It's a good exercise to, to try. Um, so sargassum, the actual macro algae or seaweed. Okay, it's brown macro algae, seaweed. Uh, you know, here's, uh, here, there's two main types right, which I showed you previously, and, you know, here it is. It's got all these little, they're almost like grapes. It's fun. I remember as a kid visiting the ocean and seeing these things on the beach, and then, you know, the funnest thing was to pop all of these guys. It's like popping the little uh, bubbles in, in bubble wrap. You know, it's the same sort of thing. Um, numerous species are distributed throughout the temperate and tropical oceans of the world. It inhabits shallow water and coral reefs, the, the algae. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so uh, it's mainly um, cold water, water organisms benefit from nutrients upwelling, but the genus Sargassum appears to be an exception. Um, any number of the normally benthic, benthic zone is the bottom, the lower layers. So, so, so any number of the normally benthic species, they may take on a planktonic, often pelagic. The pelagic is the top part of the water column. Okay, it's, it comes from the Greek for open sea. Um, and uh, yeah, so the Atlantic Ocean Sargasso Sea was named after the algae as it hosts a large amount of sargassum. The, an, the size of annual blooms in the Atlantic increased by over 100-fold starting in 2011 as a result of factors including increased fertilizer runoff of major rivers such as the Amazon and Congo. So lots more nutrients in the rivers flowing into the ocean. It's fresh water. Um, then it mixes and becomes salty, but it's light, so it stays up at the surface. And this fertilizer leads to these plankton blooms, these, these macroalgae seaweed blooms as you get huge amounts of, of the brown sargassum. And sargassum was named by the Portuguese sailors who found it in the Sargasso Sea. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so the Florida Keys, mainland South Florida are well known for the high levels of sargassum covering their shores. Um, sargassum, another name was called golf weed, it used to be called. Um, you know, although the seaweed acquired a legendary reputation for covering the entirety of the Sargasso Sea, making navigation impossible, it has since been found to occur only in drifts. Okay, so, and, uh, you know, many um, Chinese herbalists, they like powdered sargassum. Uh, you can dissolve it in warm water and drink it as tea. It's also used in traditional Chinese me medicine. It's thought to have a lot of medicinal properties. Um, different species of sargassum have folk applications in human nutrition. It's considered a rich source of vitamins, carotenoids, proteins, and minerals. And you can make different medicines from it. Um, many anti-analgesic, anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, neuroprotective, all these wonderful things, uh, you know, and we've only looked at a fraction of the uh, chemicals from that that uh, you can get from seaweeds, etc. Um, species can it can grow to a length of several meters. You know, grows generally brown or dark green in color. And you know, some species have berry like or grape like gas filled bladders that help the fronds float to promote so photosynthesis. Many have a rough, sticky texture that, along with a robust but flexible body, it helps them withstand strong water currents, sticks together. Okay, so there's lots of different species that organisms that are found in these pelagic, which is on the surface, uh, sargassum patches. Lots of different worms, mollusks, fish. You know, there's a sargassum fish right here and it can just, you know, it looks like the weed. So it just kind of hides out in, in inside. I mean, look at the, you know, it really looks like part of the uh, the weed itself. And then, you know, of course, when it drifts onto a shoreline is when it can cause problems. Um, the um, Sargasso Sea is classified as an oligotropic region. It's got warm, oxygen poor waters, low nutrient contents. So biomass production is limited by what nutrients are present. So historically low nutrient levels have limited the sargassum production. But now there's lots of nitrogen and phosphorus from the rivers, from, from you know, anthropogenic sources that are increasing the production of the biomass. So there's three likely drivers of the nutrient influx. More nutrients from the Amazon River, you know, as, as the Amazon parts, parts, parts of it are cut down. And uh, in, more nutrients from the Gulf of Mexico and coastal upwelling from the West African coast. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they've correlated nutrient output from the Amazon River, and then they see uh, a delayed effect. One or two years later, they get huge amounts of sargassum in the Sargasso Sea. You know, wind and currents move the stuff around. You know, of course, the effects of deforestation, wastewater runoff, commercial agri agriculture fertilizer on facilitating the excess accumulation of nutrients in aquatic and marine environments has been well studied. It's a driving factor in eutrophication. Um, and things have really picked up since 2011. Climate change, variations in sea level, salinity, water temperature, chemical composition, rainfall patterns, water acidity, all play roles in regulating algae blooms. As anthropogenic forces increase the variability of these factors, the frequency, duration, severity, and geographic range of harmful algae blooms have increased causing millions of dollars of lost revenue, as well as damaging fragile coastal and coral ecosystems. So of course, you know, big climate change effect on this. Um, and this is a recent article from just a few days ago, talking about the seaweed blob, twice the width of the US is heading towards Florida. This is an interesting video. If you just Google the title and have a look, uh, you know, CNN travel, you know, it's an interesting video to see you know, it's actually quite dark underneath. Not much light penetrates through this very dense mass of 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 of, of uh, weed, basically. So you know, here they call it a giant blob, which is exactly what the Florida guy said. Don't call it a blob. It's it's a it's not a blob. You know, it's a, it's a belt, if you like. 
So the sargassum, you know, and they talk about the massive accumulation since 2011. This year's bloom could be the largest ever, collectively spanning more than 5,000 miles, 8,047 kilometers from the shores of Africa to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, it doubled in size um, between December and January. So there you go, exponential growth in, in a month. You know, if it doubles again, doubles again, doesn't take long till, you know, it chokes out a lot of the um, region. And that talks about the hydrogen sulfide that can be formed. It's toxic to people and animals along the coastline. This thing's affecting, you know, affecting tourism. How do you clean it up? Well, in Barbados, uh, the locals were using 1,600 dump trucks a day to clean the beaches to make it suitable for tourists and recreation. In shallow waters, you can remove sargassum by fishing nets towed by light boats or by hand. Um, in, you, in the U.S., cleanups often done with something called barber beach rakes pulled by a tractor. Once there's an accumulation of more than a foot, the rakes don't work, so you need front-end loader dump trucks but then they can harm the beach. So, you know, you see turtles nesting on beaches. So it's a, it's a problem. Um, and then um, these things can also coincide with red tides. So red tides occur when toxin producing algae blooms grow so out of control, they discolor coastal water, so they look reddish. Uh, red tide organisms can live on sargassum and be transported by it. So, so there seems to be red tides all up and down the coast of Florida this year. Um, so, you know, when I looked on Worldview, I had a look off the Florida Keys. This is just today. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, maybe there's, you see some of the weed, but, you know, then again, uh, you know, this is just, uh, could be just, uh, you could just be seeing bottom features. It's hard to, you'd have to look from day to day and do a real study to see, um, you know, whether you were seeing the stuff or not. So just Google Worldview and play around with it. See if you can identify, you know, areas of sargassum yourself. And I told you the red tide. A red tide is impacting lots of Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, bloom levels of this Carinia brevis. It's a red tide organism. We recently detected in 24 water samples um, in a part of Florida. Um, the entire southwestern coast is experiencing red tide conditions. They began in October 2022 after Hurricane Ian um, and atypically persisted through the winter. Normally in the winter, the water gets colder and the red tide vanishes, but the water stayed warm. So the red tide, uh, you know, stuck around. Unless they get cooler weather, some significant winds that could blow it offshore and dissipate it, um, then, you know, it's, it's, it's there and it causes fish kills, etc. And there's, here's some maps from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, showing some of the regions and, uh, you know, it can cause fish kills, respiratory irritation, etc., etc. So it can really affect, uh, you know, here's a, here's a dead loggerhead sea turtle, sea, sea turtle, sea turtle. Um, Okay, so, you know, it's affecting things. Um, you know, Beach Fest, uh, which is uh, scheduled for April 15th, has been canceled due to red tide conditions. It does, it does affect people for sure. Um, and, you know, the governments, you know, they, they really don't like it, so they try to figure out ways to, uh, to get rid of it. So this is, a, there, there's a red tide current status on the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And it gives you current conditions, information about respiratory irritation, fish kills, et cetera. And I just look at the map here. Uh, this is a map. Um, and uh, they, 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 they update this, I think, just about every day. And you can see this is the Carinia brevis, um, uh, which is the um, algae that causes the red tides. Um, and you can see um so not present you know these so they sampled all along the beaches here none of it here um the gray is not present some of it on the keys there but a lot on the uh coast on on the the gulf side of florida 
okay? Some red area is very high. That's greater than a million cells per liter in the water. Um, and uh, we can go over here. This area is zoomed on because of, because of the cluster of all the, the measuring sites there. And if we go over here, you can see um, where you know, there's problem areas. So here and here, presumably they put signs on the beaches and stuff. So red tide is becoming, uh, you know, is, is an issue, um, ongoing issue in Florida. So hopefully um, in this video, I've explained a little bit about, uh, about the Sargasso Sea, uh, a little bit about the ocean gyres, and we're talking about one up here in the Sargasso, Sargasso Sea, talking about um, the, the uh, impact of nutrients, et cetera, on growing this stuff. Um, there's been large areas and exponential growth of the uh, sargassum um, since 2011 in a number of years. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a climate change signature as the water is warming. And, you know, one of the big factors is with all this stuff floating on the surface, um, then, uh, you know, it blocks the light and it can cause a lot of harm to the rest of the marine life that needs, needs light to get through, to penetrate through the water to survive. So anyway, um, yeah, so this was suggested to me by some viewers that I should have a look at the Sargasso Sea and about what's happening this year and the connections to climate change. So hopefully I've done that. Please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net and do donating to, uh, to my PayPal to support my research and videos um, as I try to join the, join the dots on abrupt climate system change. So thanks again for listening and bye for now.